um, you know, Secretary pointed out the Florida Supreme Court's decision in Williams, which of course dealt with the predecessor statute, but, but substantially similar. But even before that, I mean, can we look to the general principles of Thornburg? Um, that state, you know, if a statute's going to abrogate common law, it must unequivocally do so. Um, and I, you know, this is probably a softball question to a certain extent, but um, it doesn't appear to me that the general venue statute unequivocally uh, abrogates the common law home venue privilege. Your, your Honor, you're not supposed to say the softball part out loud. Uh, but uh, I accept the softball and, and, and will kindly, uh, kindly return it as best as I can. Uh, because your honor is absolutely right. Uh, the A, uh, Williams, uh, which was the first case uh, where the Florida Supreme Court specifically recognized the existence of a, a home venue statute, it talked about uh, section 46.02, but the verbiage of that section and the verbiage of current statute 47.021 are identical. It's any defendant in any, any county, you know, lets you sue. And they said specifically in Williams, we are not impressed by that argument, that we are not going to allow that statute to abrogate what was even then understood to be a common law principle. It's simply that that common law principle hadn't been uh, enunciated as the home venue privilege until uh, Williams v. Uh, Lake City. And as your honor pointed out, even aside from the fact that the Florida Supreme Court in 1953 has said 47.021 doesn't apply and no court since then has, has ruled differently. Uh, the principles that in Thornburg absolutely apply where if there's going to be an abrogation of a common law uh, principle, which the home venue privilege is, and uh, Williams in that decision goes through the lineage of, of from whence that decision comes uh, distilled by the common law. They, well, if not, if not the general venue statute, let's uh, turn your discussion to section 97.0115. Um, which preempts, as you know, to the state, all matters set forth in chapters 97 through 105. And one of those chapters does require the retention of ballots, forms, and other election materials. Um, and then, of course, the secretary has to maintain uniformity in the interpretation of implementation of the electric, uh, ele election law. Excuse me. So, uh, I mean, is there an argument that could be made that um, it is weighed by 97.0115 under those circumstances. The, the argument, Your Honor, has been made by Mr. Cuny and the, uh, the plaintiffs in this matter. That is not the argument that the lower court sees upon. The lower court solely ruled, I read 47.021, that says you can sue anybody anywhere, and that's what you're doing, uh, as long as there's code defense. But Mr. Cuny has made that argument that uh, the, the law is preempted because of the existence of that statute. The supervisors absolutely concur with the general concept that, of course, pre, uh, election law is preempted, just like firearms law is preempted, just like educational law is preempted. There, there are a number of bases by which preemption exists, but just because there is a, a general preemption does not change the fact that there is no specific, explicit uh, designation by the legislature that we intend venue to be in Leon County. We intend venue to be where the state is. They can say that. They do say that in other contexts. That uh, Mr. Cuny's argument later uh, includes the fact that there's a statute within 102 which talks about a multi-district election, uh, that that challenge would be heard in Leon County. They specify in that statute, Leon County. If that were the statute we were traveling under, that's a waiver. Uh, that's a statutory waiver and we would be in Leon County. This statute that, that says generically, all you supervisors maintain your public records, um, that, that does not, it doesn't mention venue, it doesn't mention anything about why we would be forced to have Miami-Dade supervisor elections trying the case of whether Miami-Dade records that never leave the confines of the county of Miami-Dade would be tried in Leon County. That's not what that statute says, and there is no preemption exemption that uh, there are four and only, yes, Your Honor. So I thought preemption simply meant that a subordinate governmental entity can't make laws that conflict with uh, the superior governmental entity, which announces preemption. And, and, and Your Honor, that, that's exactly right. The preemption is being here writ too large. There's a reason why there is no preemption exemption. 
that yes, no, no supervisor can create laws. That's for the legislature to do, and they preempted actually not only no supervisor, but no county or other municipality can create the laws, only the legislature. But just because, and that's a that's a you know, that preemption is that is certainly there, that does not change where venue is appropriate. There are four exceptions and only four exceptions. Those are the sword wielder, the good cause, the uh, statutory waiver, and joint tort feeser. None of those four apply. Uh, the lower court didn't find any of those four to apply. The lower court only went with 47.021. Because 47.021 does not apply by this court's decisions in Levy versus Bowden, Hunter v. Shaw, and the court's most recent uh, decision in Rhea, and of course the Supreme Court decision in Williams, and because preemption does not create an exemption, nor does it equate to what the plaintiffs have argued, the supervisors of election respectfully request this court to reverse and remand such that this case would be sued by the plaintiffs against any supervisor they wish within that county that that supervisor resides in pursuant to the home venue privilege. Thank you, Your Honors. I reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Shanine. Mr. Cuning. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Crystallized before this court is the question, was the trial judge correct in ordering in this election case, this case to be tried in Leon County? It bears no overstatement to recognize, as the trial judge did in argument, that this is a matter that needs to have a uniform final decision. And there are elections, statewide elections, that are impacted by the outcome of this case. Notably, as we pointed out in the pleadings, the 2022 general statewide elections. How is it that the trial judge in applying the home venue privilege in looking at the statutory scheme and finding in the exercise of his discretion, did the judge comply with the Rhea case, with the Brown versus Nagelhout case, which is the controlling definitive case here, the Grice case and the other decisions that make clear, as Your Honors have expressed, the home venue privilege is not absolute, but is to be applied where its purpose is effected. A purpose to... I'm sorry, does it make any difference that the trial judge said none of this, didn't say anything at all about the home venue privilege, didn't analyze it, didn't say, didn't actually say it doesn't apply here in spite of the fact that that was exactly what the supervisors argued against? Your Honor, I think it's clear from the two page order that the judge acknowledging having read the pleadings, home venue privilege starts nearly on page one of the pleadings and goes through the end. Having listened to argument, and this was a contentious argument, and having stated in the order, and I quote, the supervisor defendants also make essentially a forum non-convenience argument, although not characterized as such, and then proceeds to demonstrate the exercise of limited fact-based judicial discretion, finding why this case is appropriately joined for all the parties in an election law case, an election law case that derives from the very ballots, the very counting of ballots for local, statewide, and national elections. So what provision of the election code was alleged to have been violated here? There are a number of provisions, Your Honor, and although that is a merits-based determination, not appropriate for review by this court on a venue review, we've cited the federal statute on election retention as applicable to the state. We've also cited to the public records requirements of ballot materials. We have contended in conjunction, and we point out in the briefs and in a complaint, 
that Florida has a very specific election law records retention provision bound by Florida law, GS3, item 113, and we've cited this in the underlying complaint, we've referenced this in the briefs, makes clear that ballot material, including digital ballot images, are required to be preserved. They are included in the, the election retention provisions of the general statute. All those matters, Your Honor, have been itemized in the complaint, and they make clear that the underlying lawsuit is an election lawsuit that includes as a component of the election requirement for ascertainment and tabulation of the ballots, the requirement that, of course, election materials are public records, must be preserved, can't be destroyed, and the complaint without objection, but it's just that the motion to dismiss state, Your Honors, makes clear that these digital ballot images are automatically created by operation of the machinery, machinery of the election process. Well, let's focus on, so the home venue privilege is actually absolute with the exceptions carved out judicially crafted by the Florida Supreme Court. So, and I know this was discussed in the brief, but let's walk through which exceptions you contend apply in this case. Yes, Your Honor, and I do want to point out to the court that this court in the Bowdoin case has made clear, this court in the Bowdoin case cited by the parties has made clear that courts, quote, courts have discretion to dispense, end quote, with the home venue privilege when, quote, guided by considerations of justice, fairness, and convenience under the circumstances of the case, end quote. That, Your Honor, has always been the law in Florida and is the guidepost for the home venue privilege. But directly focusing on Your Honor's question, Chief Judge, we start with the Brown v. Nagelhout case that makes clear that the legislative prerogative in setting a place of venue is entitled to a place of prominence. That controls unless there is a reason it does not control. Home venue privilege, and noting, Your Honors, Brown v. Nagelhout dealt with a different common law exception known as the multiple residence rule, a different common law exception of similar origin, and it found that the venue statute took precedence over application of that common law exception. Here, we have using the statutory waiver argument as the principal reason underlying the rationale of the home venue privilege as being inapplicable in this case. And I note, Your Honor, not a single case cited by the SOEs, not a single litigation utilized by the SOEs involves any election case. There is not a single determination where SOEs have argued in an election case of statewide application that the lawsuit must be brought in eight counties, 10 counties, 27 counties, and have disparate results. In fact, that plainly would not be an argument the SOEs would ordinarily make because uniformity of the election laws is the prerequisite for Florida law. I'm sorry, I just want to go back to the focus on the exceptions, and certainly the Supreme Court in the Sun Sentinel case said that trial courts are bound to follow the home venue privilege absent one of the three recognized exceptions, and the court went on to create a fourth exception. So if you can turn back to which exceptions in particular do you believe apply here? 
Yes, recognizing, the Florida, recognizing the Florida Supreme Court at Sun Sentinel made clear that the venue was never intended to be absolute as a privilege. The statutory waiver is the most applicable recognized exception, and it exists for two reasons. First, the language of the venue statute is plainly applicable here. Second, the other statutes that inform determinations of election laws make clear that one single place where the Secretary of State is located is the proper place for this litigation. And it is true that, as the SOE says, the legislature has never passed a law that says, oh, in election cases, this is an exception to the home rule privilege. And that is quite apparent because there is no election law case. No court has ever said that the home rule privilege in an election law case takes precedent over the litigation of this matter in Leon County, where the Secretary of State is headquartered. And this is important because in the Sarasota Alliance case, where a court said the uniformity of the counting and recounting statutes do not apply locally. So this was a case that arose because a court said we're not going to apply the preemptive prescription of Florida election law. Instead, it's going to be based on the varied application. The legislature immediately, immediately passed a law that said we're correcting the statute to make it clear Florida election law is preeminent. It is preemptive. That is a plain and clear application of the fact that the legislature, when it is confronted with a case, a determination, an application that attempts to subvert the uniformity of Florida election laws, the legislature will respond. There has never been an effort, never, to confront or conflict with the uniformity of the Florida election laws. So your honor asked the question, why is it that the statutory waiver applies here? Even recognizing that RIA, RIA went out of its way. This court made clear it was not, it did not consider or apply 47.021. And we've cited in the briefs the very specific language where the court made clear, the RIA court made clear, quote, it is undisputed, end quote, that exceptions one, statutory waiver two and four don't apply. And the court then crafted its own, the lower court, own exception that RIA found was inapplicable in a case that is completely different from this case. This is a statewide uniformity of election law case. RIA was local control of school boards and individual schools and students, completely different. But nothing in RIA is on its face or in its execution finds that the statutory waiver applied or did not apply. It was undisputed when the parties litigated that issue. Here, the statutory waiver involving a defendant, the secretary of state, is proper venue and when allied, when read in consonance with the statutory provisions of the Florida election code, and we've cited them in the brief, they are not denominated venue statutes. They are denominated election law statutes. Counsel, let me ask you, you know, the secretary of state made argument in the brief. Well, actually, they moved to dismiss themselves from the case. 
arguing that they're not a proper party. Of course, that's not before us because as the Secretary of State noted, that's not a reviewable issue at this time, at least not by appeal. So we're, we, we have a case where the Secretary of State um, is a party and there's nothing we can do about it. But what if, I guess what if the Secretary of State were not a party in this case? Uh, how would that change any of your calculus? Uh, two responses, Your Honor. First, let me just note that this court in Volusia County versus DeSantis made clear that the Secretary of State is obligated to ensure the uniformity of election laws statewide. So we disagree with that position of the Secretary of State, but I recognize your hypothetical. If this case were brought merely against one SOE, the question is, can you bring this case in Miami-Dade County? That issue is not before this court. Frankly, it's unlikely that issue could ever be before this court or any court because of the requirement for uniform application of the laws. Could there be five lawsuits in five DCAs involving the identical issue with potentially disparate results on the single question? Are ballot images required to be preserved? Theoretically, there could be, but practically, there could never be because of the Florida legislative proscription that election laws must be uniformly applied and interpreted. So we do not see there any likelihood in your honor's hypothetical that there could be or would be individual cases or that the second. Thank, thank you, counsel. Your, your time has now expired unless the panel has any additional questions. Um, seeing none, I will thank you for your, your arguments. I'll turn it back to Mr. Shanine. Thank you, your honor. Madam clerk, if you'd please add, uh, the commensurate amount of time to Mr. Shanine's argument. Thank you, your honor. Uh, in, in rebuttal, first, we have to turn to this Bowden case that, that he was just discussing because the Bowden case couldn't have made it more explicit. This is first district back in 1992, quote, the venue provisions of chapter 47 Florida statutes do not abrogate this common law privilege, the home venue privilege. That's the direct quote from the very case that he's citing is an argument for why we should now uh, expand or make elastic this home venue privilege. And I must turn to another point when he, he repeats that it is not absolute. It's not absolute. And Judge Ray, you, you corrected him, frankly, because that needs correction. It is and must be an absolute. There are the four exceptions. And those four exceptions, if they apply, are why you might be able to sue uh, a governmental entity outside of their home venue. But as this court said in Jacksonville, uh, JEA versus Clay County, and as the second DCA had said in Addison versus Tampa, unless a recognized exception applies, the home value privilege is absolute. And, and there's a reason for that, Your Honor. The supervisors of election have never, uh, as Mr. Cutie points out, been sued outside of their counties individually to make this an issue that's ever come up to an appellate court, but certainly school boards have. And that's exactly what happened in RIA and why that case was before this court then and why this court in RIA said the exact same thing. That was a case that he tries to distinguish it, but it's indistinguishable. It's a statewide case involving statewide application of legislatively set mandates that the commissioner of education was supposed to have control over. And despite that, this court had no issue in saying explicitly, no, you cannot sue these eight school boards in Leanna County. You must bring a suit against those school boards in their own venues. And, and this I've got to also return to is this construct that somehow it's impossible to sue one supervisor of election in their home county and get a ruling that would be of utility to them or, or the supervisors. And, and we, we frankly disagree as a matter of straight jurisprudence that of course they could sue. This is a public records case involving whether or not these ballot images that are maintained for a fifth of a second at most while the, the ballots are being processed and these large counties that he sued simply cannot maintain them 
without massive administrative difficulties, bogging down election results, increasing expense dramatically. There's a reason why these eight counties do not do it. And there are plenty of other counties that, that, that don't do it either, but they weren't sued for reasons that, that, that we don't know. But he didn't need, they didn't need to sue all eight counties and they certainly didn't need to sue these eight counties in a county other than their home venue and pick one that was none of their venue in Leon County. Instead, a single suit against say Miami Day in Miami Day uh, would be a matter that could be heard there. You know, other supervisors would certainly, you know, weigh in in an amicus brief should that matter go up on an appeal. And when it did, that appellate court decision then of the third district court would be binding on everybody across the state uniformly. Proud of the state makes it clear that vertical stare decisis and horizontal stare decisis would both apply so that every supervisor in the land would know what the rules are if a single county got sued in a single venue and the home venue privilege was properly applied and we'd have an answer, we wouldn't have a multiplicity of results and the, the statutes would be properly applied and the uh, home venue privilege, which is an absolute, would be properly maintained. For all of these reasons, Your Honor, the supervisors of election of each of the eight counties and, uh, and Mr. Figlio is here on behalf of the Secretary of State, we respectfully request this court to reverse and remand so that the home venue privilege can be properly maintained and we can proceed in whichever venue uh, the plaintiffs decide to continue to so long as that venue is in fact a home venue for the appropriate uh, supervisor of election. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Mr. Shanine. Thank you, Mr. Cuny, for your arguments today. Oral argument on this case is now concluded. We'll go into recess. Have a good afternoon.